microphones. This video is just a quick introduction to how to read a poem. A lot of people say that they don't get poetry or don't know how to read it. So this intro is designed to help make poetry less intimidating. Now keep in mind, there's no right way to read any piece of literature. So we're not going to go into how to make sense of metaphors or other figurative language. Instead, we're going to talk about the main difference between prose or creative works written in sentences and paragraphs and poetry or creative works written with line breaks and white space. And that's really the main difference. Poetry has line breaks and white space and those line breaks mean something. Especially in modern free verse poems, the poet didn't just throw in line breaks randomly. Instead, he or she made one line end where it does and the next line begin where it does for a reason. That reason is often because they want you to think about what each line means on its own. For example, what might the third line of Nate Marshall's poem, my mom's favorite rapper was too short, mean all on its own. On its own, it says, in my mind, I'm a cuss word. Imagine you overheard someone say this line and this line alone to someone on the phone as you passed by. How would you think he felt about himself? Would you stay to hear the rest of the conversation or would you rush away? Now imagine that you heard that line as part of two different sentences. Before I could talk, I could stalk the streets of Oakland in my mind. I'm a cuss word pitched at the tip of the tongue, sung like an omen. How does he seem to think and feel about himself now? Did the meaning change once you read the whole sentence? To get the most out of reading a poem, read it at least two different ways. Read as much of it as you can straight through as if it were prose, kind of like the version on the left. Stop only for punctuation marks or where it seems like you've reached the end of a sentence. But also read each line to see what it means on its own. Pause wherever there's white space. This kind of reading will also help you see subtler rhymes and rhythms, such as talk and stock, pitched and tip, omen and women in this poem. When you read two different ways, there might be contradictions or tensions between what you think when you read the lines separately versus what you think when you read them like prose. That's fine. In fact, the author probably wants you to think about these contradictions and tensions. Your job as a reader of poetry is to make the poem with the writer, to imagine and guess and create new ideas based on what you've been given. And often the writer wants you to think about how or if both different readings can be true. On the other hand, not every poem works like this. Some poems, like the Persian Huzzle, are made of lines that are supposed to stand alone. Most poetry written before the 20th century was penned in traditional predetermined forms, which followed a specific rhyme scheme or pattern and had a set number of stressed and unstressed syllables. Here's a video that talks more about that. In the meantime, here's an example from the 19th century Percy Shelley's famous sonnet, Ozymandias. You probably heard of that guy if you've watched or read any of the Watchmen series. But anyway, sonnets like this one have the same number of lines, 14, and the same number of stressed syllables in each line, five. The rhythm is unstressed, stressed, unstressed, stressed, like this. Da dum, da dum, da dum. Da -dum, da -dum. I won't read the whole poem for you, but I will read the first eight lines, just so you can hear the rhythm in action. I met a traveler from an antique land 
who said, two vast and trunkless legs of stone stand in the desert, near them on the sand, half sunk a shattered visage lies, whose frown and wrinkled lip and sneer of cold command tell that its sculptor well those passions read, which yet survive stamped on these lifeless things, the hand that mocked them and the heart that fed. Now, you've probably noticed that sometimes Mr. Shelley adds words to his lines or uses longer words than he could have. For example, in line four, a visage is just a face. <laughs> Why did he choose the word visage then? Especially because that word is less familiar than faces for most people. Well, maybe it was because visage rhymes with vision and it might reinforce the otherworldly vibe of the poem. But it could also be because visage fits the meter and face doesn't. Try it. Half a shattered face lies is missing one unstressed syllable. There's just too many stresses back to back for a sonnet. The same goes for nothing beside remains. If that sounds a little unclear or awkward to you, it might be because beside can mean a few different things. It could mean nothing else or nothing next to. Yet both of those versions throw off the rhythm of the poem. As you read older poems or older translations of old poems, be aware that the word choice might be a bit fancy or confusing, not to show off, but to fit the predetermined meter that the poet chose. In those cases, you can simply translate the lines into simpler wording like the purple student's notes on the screen. Now the poet might also put words in an, in an unusual order. For instance, line six could just as easily say, its sculptor read those passions well, instead of putting well in the middle of the line. Shelley probably arranged the words the way he did to keep the meter going, but you don't have to in your notes. And if that process of rewording and rearranging ideas from your reading sounds familiar, that's because it should. Reading poetry really isn't all that different from reading anything else. You still have to paraphrase as you go to make sure you understand. There's just one extra rereading to make sure you're getting as much as you can from the line breaks. Now who knew reading poetry could be so easy?